It's going to be like the uh, message revelation such as you've never heard before. I believe, I think God has shown us something that's really important and crucial as far as the enemy is concerned and his tactics. And uh, we've, we've uncovered something that is, I think it's huge um, in the last couple of days. And so we're, gonna, we're just going to get ready for a move of God. And good to see Taylor here again today. Uh, praise the Lord. It's been a, it's been a long time, girl. Yeah, uh, we miss you, and uh, now that you're back to stay, amen, you're going to be free, you're going to walk in the power of God, and uh, praise the Lord for that. And so, today, um, I want to preach a message called, Out of Chaos Comes Life. And uh, this message come to me, or this title came to me a couple of weeks ago, I remember Ross, we were talking in the back, and and I, I, I mentioned that phrase, I said, out of chaos comes life. And, and uh, after this week, I really see it, how it happens and, um, and how to focus on the things of God, no matter what are going on, what's going on around you. Um, I really am excited about what God is about to do and what he has done in the last couple of days. Um, don't be mistaken I will miss Sharon um, she was a, 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 a she was just a light in my life at all times you know didn't matter uh, what was going on what kind of turmoil we were in or she was in or whoever was in after five minutes of getting together we would be into hysterical laughter and uh, there was always there was always that in her. She loved to laugh, and she made me laugh. And we had a weird relationship, and but we always had fun together. And and so, but anyway, uh, I want to get on to what I have to say here because I think it's very important. If you're joining us on the internet today, um, you need to hear what is about to be sp spoken. I believe for a lot of you in here today, this is probably, it could possibly be the most important message that you've ever heard in your life. And I'm excited because not everybody's here today, but I'm excited we have an internet and we have DVDs and we have all the stuff that we can pass out after because I think it's something that's really crucial. God has revealed something really crucial to us that we need to really concentrate on. And, um, but out of chaos comes life. And let's pray together. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into this, and I'm not sure how it's going to all come out, but the Lord says, don't worry, it'll be good. Amen. Amen? So, I feel His strength like I've never felt before. I have felt, in the last, last night I was near exhaustion, but I felt so clear in my head what He wanted me to do here today. And so, we're going to be praying for people today. Um, at the end of the service, if you need prayer, you need healing, we're going to be praying for you because the Spirit of the Lord is about to explode. So let's pray together. I re repeat this prayer after me, and uh, you'll understand why I feel the way I am in a couple seconds here. Let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, speak to my heart and change my life. In your precious name, amen. So in, out of chaos comes life. And in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it said, Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. See, God is the only one who can take a chaotic situation and bring life out of it. Basically, what was on earth before the Spirit of God was hovering over was chaos. And once you begin to serve God, and I've been, it's going to be 20 years in September since Jesus rescued me, pulled me out of the pit, opened my eyes up to the reality of God out of nothingness, uh, out of having no belief in anything, uh, an atheist and I, 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 I love the, I read a statement here a little while ago. It says, 
because there's atheists, it proves there is a God. Amen. Because if there was no God, you wouldn't have any atheists, right? There'd be nothing to talk about. And so I was one of those. And, and, uh, but God in his mercy, his infinite mercy, revealed himself to me and continues to in a powerful way. And it's absolutely amazing to watch when you start to recognize the awesomeness of God. All of a sudden, out of nothing, he started creating with words. He took an empty, he took a formless, empty, dark planet, and light exploded, and out of that light started the process of light, which was activated by words. Just words. Just he spoke, and life came. He spoke, and light came. And words are essential. And the words that he speaks are life. The words that he speaks are power. The words that he speaks are they're transforming, resurrectional, oh, just Amen. explosives. <laughs> I've never heard that phrase before. And life started to come forth because the Spirit of God hovered above the earth. And without the Spirit of God, life cannot exist. Without the, the Spirit of God, life is meaningless. Why do you think there's such a search in all over the world, doesn't matter who it is, whether you're a drug addict, whether you're an alcoholic, whether you're addicted to pornography, or whether you're a religious zealot, or whether whatever, it doesn't matter. There's this search for meaning of life. And everybody is searching for meaning of life. I wish somebody would come up with a track that said, the search for meaning of life. Because most tracks just say, are you going to heaven or whatever. But the people of the earth want to know, I want to know, can I have life? Can I experience it now? Can I find a reason? Or is it just also that when we die, we can go to heaven? Or is there more to it? And yes, there's more to it. And without the Spirit of God, there is, it, life is meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Read Ecclesiastes and you find out Solomon, a man of God, who tried everything, you know, he comes, he says, everything, he says, everything is meaningless. Everything is vanity. Everything is emptiness. Nothing has any meaning. Because he tried to do a lot of things without God. And then at the end, at the end of the story, it's like, there's only one conclusion. God is everything. <laughs> God, God is everything. We, you know, really, my, my, what, 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 what do I think of life right now? Jesus is everything to me. And out of that, Everything flows. Life flows. That's why I can have life. That's why I can have joy today. Even though someone so precious to me was taken, and I won't see her again until I see her again. <coughs> Whether that's when, if we're going to be here when Jesus comes back and we see her coming with him, that's going to be awesome. Or what, It doesn't matter. Whenever I, or whether my life doesn't go on forever or here on earth or whatever. However it works, like I prayed to God to, you know, I wasted 29 years of my life. I prayed, I said, can I have the 29, those 29 years I wasted, can I have them on the end of my life so I can preach till I'm 95 and then from I'm 95 till I'm 99, can I, can I build houses somewhere? That's how I talk to God because God's not normal. He's not, he's not us. He can do whatever he wants. If he wants to give it, like Caleb, Caleb in the Bible, when he was 80 years old, had the same strength he had when he was 40. I like that. It sounds like he knew something about God that we don't know. But life, the Spirit of God hovered and life came. He spoke, he spoke the Spirit of God hovered, started speaking words, life came. Just like that. And then Hebrews, I love this, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 14, and uh, it's just a, a powerful portion of Scripture, and I'm just going to read it quickly. And it says, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets of many, of, at many times and in various ways, but in these last days He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through whom He made the universe. 
The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he provided purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior uh, to the angels as the name he had, has inherited to the superiors to theirs. Or inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his, his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he said, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. And, your right, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have, loved, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you will remain the same, and, you, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation? Hallelujah. I love verse 8 and verse 9. It says, But about the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. Ever and ever. And righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by, geno- by anointing you with the oil of joy. Jesus, he is the exact representation of God's nature. You want, people ask you, well, what's your theology? It's Jesus. Jesus is perfect theology. You want to know what perfect theology is? Study about Jesus. Live for him. Become like him. His, his love and righteousness. He, he loves righteousness and he hates wickedness. Out of wickedness comes disease, comes death. Out of righteousness comes healing and life. God, and you can, you'll say this to me, you'll, you'll say, well, you know, right away you're going to disagree with me, but God absolutely provides healing all the time. And people, well, people will say, well, what about Job? I got good news for you today to tell you that I am not a disciple of Job, I'm a disciple of Jesus. Amen? Some of y'all are worshiping Job or discipling after Job. I'm, a, I'm just Job. You're not Job because Job never had a covenant like you have. Jesus is the answer. Everything that we study in the Old Testament should lead us to Jesus as the answer. Everything. Everything that we study in the Old Testament should lead us to Jesus as the answer. Period. <laughs> Amen? In the Old Testament, God treated people, or he dealt with people the way he had to. In the New Covenant, he treats people the way he wants to. As merciful, as a, as, as a healer, as a deliverer. Every person that came to Jesus for a miracle never left disappointed. Not once. They never once left disappointed, ever. Ever. He was 100% successful as a man dependent on God. Amen? He was human. He was God made flesh, but he was totally flesh. He was human, but totally God. He messed up every funeral he, in, he ever intended, attended, <laughs> including his own. Did you hear that? He messed up every funeral that he went to. 
and especially his own. Jesus manifested the will of God for all the inhabitants of the earth. He man- this is the, you want to know the will of God? Study Jesus. Look at his life. Live, li- live the life of Jesus. Because our, our goal, God's goal for us is to become like Christ. To be his body upon the earth. To continue to walk in the fullness that he walked in. He walked in the fullness. He didn't walk in gifting. He walked in the fullness of God at all times. And he is the answer. He is the answer. Sharon just went through a battle that was very difficult to explain. There's a lot of people and there's a lot of theologians that will say, well, it was God's will for her to die from that cancer. Was it God's will for her to get cancer? Absolutely not. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went, about, went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. All who were under the power of the devil because he, he, he just did good. He healed all. He did, doesn't say he healed here, a little here, a little there. He healed all who were oppressed and who were under the power of the devil. Because, now we know that sickness comes from the enemy. 1 John chapter uh, 3, verse 8 says, He who does what is sinful is of the devil because, of, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the, the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Period. That's why he... That's why he appeared. He didn't appear. He, he appeared to destroy the works of the devil, period. And so those works, some of those works are cancer, depression, all, the, all these mental illnesses that are upon the earth. He come to set people free. He come to set the captives free. And then I think about the woman from Luke chapter 13 who, who was bent over for 18 long years and she couldn't, she couldn't straighten up. And people thought, well, that must be the will of God for her to walk in. God's going to teach her a lesson through that illness. God's going to teach her a lesson through that. And he's going to get closer to God through that. And that is hogwash too because in verse 16 of chapter 13 it said, should not, Jesus said, should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? Who, who had her bound? Satan. And here's one of, and, and she was a covenant people, and Jesus said, this isn't right. So he went up to her, touched her, and healed her. I think she was pretty happy. She said, so this is what it looks like from here. Instead of looking there at everything out the top of her eyes, she's now looking straight. Seeing things clear. All sickness is outside of the will of God for his people. And Jesus touched this woman who lived in chaos all her life, and out of that chaos came life. The will of God comes in the midst of distress. And I'm really getting tired of everybody interrogating God. They blame God all the time. They ask God, why God? Why God? Why God? And if they're not blaming God, the next ones they blame are Adam and Eve. Always. Those poor people, leave them alone already. You know, it's because of them, the fall. Well, we would have done so much better. God trusted them a lot more than he trusts us because we had to have the Savior on earth before we were born. <laughs> Amen? Leave those poor people alone. I think they've got enough blame. You know? But you never hear anybody say much about the devil, do you? Oh, why, God, why did you do this? Oh, why, God, why didn't you? 
Oh, why, God, why? You don't hear much about the devil. You see, the devil, he, you know, he, was, he was Lucifer at one time. So don't call him Lucifer no more because he's not Lucifer no more. Lucifer was when he was anointed. And Ernie pointed that out to me. He showed me. He says, look, he's not Lucifer. He's the devil. He's Satan. Lucifer was when he was a good guy. But all of a sudden, he wanted to be like God. He's going to be God. I want to be God. I want to be higher than God. I want to be like God. I want to be higher than God. I want to be God. I want to be God. I want to be God. He decides to, create, to, to rebel, and, and he's going to take over, and he's going to be God. He's just thinking about this, and God says, No, you're not. You're out. Get out of here. He Cast him down to the earth. He goes down to the earth, and he's got... Because of he's he's out of the light of Jesus and he's out of he's out of he's out of the the canopy of protection of God all around him. He now be, gets the ability to deceive. He now becomes a, a deceiver. He deceives. He goes to Adam and Eve and he starts getting them to doubt God, and they're deceived. And all of a sudden, you know, and and Adam all all of a sudden Adam or Eve does this. And she she gets deceived, and and then Adam's right there, and he gets he gets you know he it's a mess, eh? And all oh, those stupid people they should have done that. But they're they're up against something that has such a tremendous force. They don't know what to do with it. And so, it's, if you look around all the earth right now, you, you can blame, oh, blame Barack Obama, George Bush, everybody all over the world, we're blaming all these individuals. If, it was, if there was just better leadership, it would be better. But if you point the blame to who deserves it, it's the devil. Right? And Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Then he came, he came and he died for our sins. He took care of our sins. He took care of our disease at the whipping post. Then he took care of our sins on the cross. He took care of all sickness. He took care of all disease. He took care of all, he took care of death. He took care of everything. And then he dies, goes in the grave for three days. Then he comes up, he's around the earth for 40 days, teaching about things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And then after 40 days, he's taken up to heaven. He, sends, he, sends up, he goes up to heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Then he sends the Holy Spirit and says, go down there and fill those people up so they can do what I started. And, 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 and somewhere along the way, it all got lost that we can be empowered. Somewhere the message just became, so when you die, you can go to heaven. Just ask Jesus into your life, so when you die, you can go to heaven. And there was nothing else about the power. Of course heaven's important, and of course I want to be there. And of course I know that Sharon is there right now. What do you think I'm, what do you think I'm, I'm rejoicing right now? Ain't no stinking devil going to touch her ever again. And so, so I'm excited about God. And I'm excited. All deception, all lies, all sin, all sickness, all disease comes from the devil. So quit interrogating God. Quit interrogating God. A few months ago, I preached the message that I asked the question. I said, do you trust God enough never to ask why again? And when I preach a message like that, guess who he's asking first? So I was asked today, did you lose, did, did this shake your faith? Absolutely not. This does not shake my faith. Because greater is he that is in me than he who is in the world. You can't shake Jesus. How do you expect to shake Jesus? Turn your life over to him and then you won't be shaken no more like a, like a leaf, like a reed in the wind. I am totally 100% dependent on Jesus Christ as for everything that happens day-to-day -day basis, period. I don't have all the answers all the time, but I know that He does, and I know that He wants to reveal them to His people. And so, here we are. God has given us a commission to advance the kingdom of God and to stop Satan. How do you like that? The kingdom now and the kingdom to come. And so, you know, we prayed for Sharon. We fasted. We took authority. We did everything we could and we come up short. And I am not sure why, but I, I don't feel guilty about it. 
I don't feel like we, we, we were a bunch of dinglings that didn't, do, didn't try our hardest. God knows we tried our hardest. We tried everything, and we believed in healing. And right to the end, Sharon believed in healing. And I was, I, I, I just, I was amazed at how she was. The, the Thursday morning, I woke up, and I'm in the bed in her room. <laughs> and she's on the recliner. <laughs> yeah. And so I wake up, and I see this guy kneeling down and talking to Sharon. And it's a doctor, one of the doctors. And, and he walked into the room. He said, this, that's not the right room. There's some other person in that room. Because Sharon was behind a curtain there. And, and, uh, and so I see, I see this guy. He's kneeling down. He's kneeling down. And he's talking to her. Sharon, you don't have long to live. There's no hope. You might as well give up. Forget about it. And the la, 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 la. And I want to get up and I want to give him the five-fold ministry. And so, so I look at this, I go, you know, and then he leaves and Sharon looks right at me. She says, I'm going to win this thing. And then a little while later, she says, you know, she's all drugged up and all that mess. And, and uh, she, she says to me, I don't know if I want to talk to the kids about a funeral or what I should do. And I, I said, well, what do you want to talk about? She says, I can't believe you're even thinking about it. Okay, <laughs> I don't want to talk about it, like mistake number one for me. But out of this chaos, I still believe to me Jesus is still the healer. And out of the chaos, life is coming. And I've learned so many lessons from this, this particular thing, this, especially the last week. I found out that man does not have much to offer. Their best is not enough. Their best is nothing. You know, and, and I mean, they're trying their hardest, they're working their hardest, they're doing their best, but without the power of God, they don't have a heck of a lot to offer. You know, the, in the, I watched, one day I watched three body bags leave that palliative care unit, three body bags, and I'm thinking about all the hurt that's attached to every one of those, those people being dragged out of, or being carried out in those body bags, all the family members that are crying and weeping for their lost one, all the, all the pain that that person just went through that just was in this unit, and they're on drugs, and, and these drugs make them. My sister was way more scared of the drugs than she was of the cancer. And so Sharon passes on, and, and she went to be with the Lord, no question about it. I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever, there's no doubt. And so we start living with the fact. And here's where I want to show you how evil the devil is. We start, we, she passes away about 7 o'clock in the morning. We get to Regina about 11. I went home that night and I, just to get some rest. I'd been spent three or four days in the hospital. And, and you know, I'd leave whatever. You know, I'd spent the nights. And, and you just don't sleep very good there. So we went home for one night and she dies in the morning. She, she goes to be with God. So we get home, we, you know, we're all learning to live with the fact that she's gone and, you know, everybody's mourning. And we're in the house, this is about 1.30 in the afternoon, we're getting ready to go do the funeral um, preparations or whatever you call them, arrangements, yeah. We're getting ready to do the arrangements and all of a sudden, chaos erupted in this house. And all of a sudden, Megan, Sharon's daughter, is screaming at the top of her lungs. Her brother Jordan, Sharon's son, is yelling at the top of his lungs. All of a sudden, their little baby, little I Isabella, uh, how, how old is she now, 11? She'll be one on the 21st. Be one on the 21st. All of a sudden, she dies. She died in her dad's arms. She's blue. Megan is a nurse. She finds no vital signs. She doesn't know if she's choking. There's back thrust. She starts hitting back thrust, back thrust, and, just, and she's screaming, Isabella, Isabella. And it's like the whole place is chaotic. Our family is just, everybody's just, we're, well, what? This cannot be. And I mean, I'm thinking, this cannot be. This is, this is a nightmare. This is a nightmare. This is, cannot be. 
And it's horrifying. And I'm like, what is going on here? This cannot be. And this little girl has no life in her. Her face is blue. She's a beautiful little baby. And all of a sudden, I felt like I was in the room by myself with Isabella and with Megan. A vacuum had created. And I thought, I went and prayed for her. I, I said, I command in the name of Jesus, I bind the spirit of death and I command the spirit of life to come back in to this little girl. And instantly she started to breathe and color came back and she became alive again. Megan, Megan is screaming, saying, my daughter and my mother die in the same day. How can this be? How can this be? And I thought I did it quietly. I thought it was just very quiet. I didn't think there was anybody in the room. I laid hands and, and I, what I did, and, and then I just walked away. And, and that little girl, is, all of a sudden, she's on the floor, and she's looking around, and she looks at something over here and starts talking, and she talks all the time, but not English. I'm not sure what language it is. <laughs> and, and she's smiling. They take her to the doctor. They take her to the doctor, and they, they, the ambulance comes, the police, every, it's like... And Megan still... We're all shaking. We're numb. I wish I could say I went up with this great boldness. I was scared to death, my friends. I was shaking. I was l limp. I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And, uh, and this little girl... They go to the doctor, and Megan and Jordan, George, Megan, her husband George, are in the hospital, and they just broke because they said she was gone. I didn't think anybody seen what happened. I didn't care. All I wanted was Isabella alive. I didn't see. I wasn't going to say anything. I wasn't going to mention it. And they started coming to me one by one. Terry, she came back. You prayed, and she came back. I said Jesus brought her back. My nephew says, no, Terry, you brought her back. I said, Jesus brought her back. We're just the point of contact. We do what we're told. And no, you did. I said, whatever. I said, Jesus brought her back. So don't worry about it. And so here they are, and they're just, what was that all about? So then, she, well, they're in the hospital. Jordan and Kenny and Doug and my brother, Doug, my two brothers and I and, and Jordan go do the, we're doing the arrangements. I said, what are we doing here? Like, just men trying to figure out what to do and like <laughs> you talk about a, a, an odd bunch <laughs> we're looking at, yeah. we're we don't, we don't know what to do here and so so and we got no women to pick flowers none of that stuff <laughs> pick the cow so Jordan tells the funeral director about this he says oh that hap that happens he says we've buried we have buried grandchildren with their grandparents in the same casket. They will die from crib death the day of the, the same the day the grandparent died. And then I started thinking, that happened here last year. That right over here, so I can't remember the name, but it happened. The grandparent died and the baby died the same day. So that evil, wicked one, what he does is he, he kills the person, and then takes the baby and then blames God. And then he put the thought in a preacher's head, well, the grandma or the grandpa needed that baby with her when she goes to be with Jesus. And that, this is the lie from the pit of hell. Or they say, or they say that little baby, God needed another angel. So if God needed an angel, he would create that angel. So, I thought, you evil, wicked demon. I couldn't believe it. But I'm just rejoicing. And I thought, you know, I started thinking about failures that I've had in life. And in Nigeria in the year 2000, I'm at this huge crusade. And I want, to, I want to say this to encourage you. I'm at this huge crusade 
in Africa with Reinhard Bonnke. I'm just a watch. I'm just watching. I'm, a, I'm, just, I'm just along for the ride, basically. So this little, all of a sudden, I'm standing at the, I've seen two wheelchairs pop up. People have been healed. And I wanted to see these guys walk by because I just wanted to see this, the miracle. And all of a sudden, the guy comes running out of the crowd, and he's got a Reinhard Bonnke uh, protocol badge on. And he says, Pastor, I need you to come with me immediately. There's people who need prayer. You've got to come. And we weren't supposed to pray for anybody. We were told not to. And he begged me. He says, Pastor, this is a matter of life and death. You must come with me. And I'm thinking, oh, what I do? You know, I've never refused to pray for people. And he, he says, come with me. So I figured, I go. We go into the crowd, and we get into this, where it's, a, it's this one of these small services. I think there was a million people there that night. And um, we're in, I don't know, 30 rows in, and, there's, and the guy turns around and gets, he says, here we are, there's a lady here. She brought her child. The child died on route, and she wants the baby resurrected from the dead and believes she can do it. And I go, What? It was like instantly I just started sweating. I was just like, I th- what would you do? So I, did, I didn't know how to even how to do something like this. So I just started praying, begging God to bring the baby back. I didn't know about the authority. I didn't know any of that stuff. And we prayed, and I went and got a, a powerful evangelist from South Africa. We went we prayed for this little girl together, and she didn't come back to life. Three and a half years. I still see her face. She's the prettiest little girl. And I was devastated. I go, what? How could I, uh, you know, what did I do wrong? And, and the Lord started speaking. And I got rebuked from the, the people there. I said, you shouldn't have did that. You know, you could, you know, that. we told you you couldn't pray. And I asked George Mann. He's a good friend of mine. He was the one rebuking me. And I'm, I'm okay with the rebuke. I said, George, what would you do? He said, I would have prayed. I said, Okay. He says, but Terry, this could have ruined your life forever. You could, have got, you could have got blown away and never done that again. And the Lord started speaking to me, and he says, Terry, when you have an opportunity to pray for somebody, you pray. The results are up to me. You pray. You're the point of contact. You pray. So out of that failure, I learned that God wanted me to pray for the dead. And, and over the next year and a few years later i ended up praying for a man in norway who died and i prayed for him and he came back to life i just did that same thing and and then we prayed for other people that have died and they haven't come back to life but we prayed we seen a little girl megan come up to me after and she says this little girl was dead you spoke she said when you spoke life she came back i felt it Yeah. And if you don't, you don't believe me, ask my brother. He was there. It's just what killed us all. Ask my wife. She was there. Ask Sharonda. She was there. Ask Justin. He was there. Ask Sienna. She was there. Ask my brother Doug. He was there. Ask Jordan and Katie. They were there. Everybody was there. Everybody's seen it, and everybody believes it. Hallelujah. Amen. So, out of chaos comes life. And honestly, I didn't think anybody seen it. And I really, I, all I cared about was that little girl and that mother. And I kind of know what Jesus felt like when he handed back that son to her mother, his mother. I give the daughter back to her, alive. The ambulance came, took her away. The doctors can't explain. They're going to do tests this week and... But I've got something that we need to do from now on. When, when a grandparent or somebody dies, we have to put the protection, pray for protection upon their grandchildren, grandbabies, because it's a tendency. I found it out now. There's no doubt about it. The devil does it all the time. And then he, then he puts the blame on God. And he does it with everything. Everything he blames God. The people of God blame God. Why God? Why God? Why God? I'll tell, you what, I'll tell you something right now that you better remember the rest of your life. He left us in charge. He said, when you go, 
heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. That's it, period. And what is missing in our society and what is missing in churches, why we don't see a whole lot of healings, a whole lot of deliverance, is the lack of honor. There's no honor towards God. There's no honor towards the people of God. There's no honor towards one another. We've eliminated honor, said all that matters is God. You mean nothing. Everybody's important. Everybody, honor has to go to God and honor has to go to one another. We must honor one another. If we don't, we're never going to see a tremendous healing move of God. And I believe we will. I believe we've started it. And I'll tell you what. Oh, the situation could be a whole lot different today had it not been for Jesus. And I thought the battle that we are in, and we take it so lightly, we don't understand, we, 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 we just, you know, everybody needs to be involved in this. I don't care how old you are. How, you know, when we were praying, when that little girl, she died, guess what? There was a gathering at this church to pray for, for Sharon and her children and her family and us at one, right at 1.30 when uh, this all broke out. Immediately I text and said, There's, this is insane. The people of God were already, there was already a, a move going on in this place for protection of God, for God in that place. It was amazing to hear about it. And so now the devil, he's, he's saying, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? You're never going to see. You see. All this accusations coming, all these things coming, everything's coming. Lies, deception. And in Acts chapter 4, there was a moment where a great healing took place. And, and they told, they told the, the religious people of the time, religious people at the time said, you, you better stop praying in the name of Jesus. He says, you can't use that name no more. You better stop and they, of course, didn't listen. And they got together and they had a prayer meeting. And in this word, in this prayer meeting, in verse 29 of Acts chapter 4 to 31, it says, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And that's what we got to cry out for. You hear Satan's threats. You hear his lies. Lord, now give us the boldness to preach your word, to preach your kingdom, to, you know, we, to bold and to go out boldly and proclaim the goodness of God in the land of the living. A time is here, friends. A time is here. We've got to quit walking around like we're some defeated, abused people that have no strength and no power and no nothing to do nothing. The time is here. The time is now. He's equipping his people. He's, and Jesus is saying, enough, enough. It's your responsibility. Quit laying the blame on me. He does the work. He is, it's him. Without Jesus, we can do absolutely nothing. And I've thought, I found out one thing in particular in this whole situation is that in order for the kingdom of God to be advanced, we have to have an extreme supernatural love for God. An extreme love where we're absolutely consumed with Him. Everything about Him. We see Him. We breathe Him. We eat Him. We, we just, cons we're consumed. We're, he's a consuming fire and He takes every. And we had a consuming love for God and a, and a, and we, a, a, a supernatural love and an extreme love for God and an extreme hatred, 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 hatred towards the devil. Period. It's far too much. 
it's far too much credit. I think we can do it. Out of failure comes victory. I'm not afraid to try things. I'm not afraid to pray for the dead. I'm not afraid to pray for people. These people say, well, that could look bad. Well, you ain't going to hurt them anymore if they're dead and they don't get up. They're still dead. Do you hear? Just watch how you do it. It's all. Use your brain. God's given us a brain for a purpose. It's time we start using it. All right? Amen. Amen. So I feel the time is now. Out of that failure in Africa comes victory. Long ways down the road. We're so scared. What if we fail? I'd sooner try and fail than do nothing and succeed. And so this week, we, I ask you to pray for Megan and Jordan and their, their, their children and, and the whole family. Pray for our family. Pray for Ken's family because there's, there's something going on here. It's, it's, it's substantial. There's a major move going on here and there's a major counteraction to stop what's going on too. So the time is here, the time is now. Does Jesus still heal? Of course he does. Was it his fault that Sharon never got healed? Absolutely not. I don't understand it all. I don't have all the answers. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Doesn't matter. We're still going to pray. I'm not going to point any fingers at anybody. That's the devil's scheme, not ours. We do what we can and leave the rest up to God. Amen? Amen. And so, we have to be alert. We have to be aware of what's going on around us all the time. We have to quit being self-centered and thinking about ourselves. We must think for the glory of God, for His kingdom, His, His honor, His everything it's all about him when he gets the glory when he gets the honor everything will begin to work we honor one another we we start to love one another the way that jesus prayed for us jesus prayed that we would love one another as him and the father love one another that's a prayer that's going to be answered this place i felt it here i feel the love of god here i feel the love of the people i know we've made a lot of mistakes we do things and We've made mistakes. We've done things we probably shouldn't have, but we're going to continue to do things. We're still going to experiment. We're going to do whatever we can to advance the kingdom of God. And he will teach us and he will show us, but he doesn't do everything for us. We always had the attitude, let's just sit back and wait for God to show up. No, he's waiting for us to show up so that he can show up. Amen? My sister's saying, preach it, brother. Amen. All right. So, now that some of you are mad at me, it's okay, I forgive you. I'm not mad at you. Somebody on the internet I know for sure is mad at me, but that's okay. They can't reach me from their computer. Heresy, heresy. They'd be shouting. But the ones that showed heresy very seldom have any fruit. So I want the worship team to come. If you need prayer, amen. Thank you. We, uh, we got a job to do, guys. And the interrogation of God stops here today. We pray to God. We ask Him for wisdom. We ask Him for understanding, but we do not interrogate. Who do we think we are 
that we can interrogate God. Who do we think we are? He's God. You know, I'm just saying. And it's not your fault because that's what religion has done for years and years and years. Put all everything on Him. So the time is here, the time is now. So we're going to pray for healing. We're going to worship God. We're going to leave the altars open. If you want prayer for healing, you want prayer for empowerment, today we're going to pray. And we're going to pray for boldness. If, you, if you're lacking in boldness, actually, we don't really need to pray. You just got to learn what you know, and you become bold. Amen? So fear not. You know, fear, fear is a crippling factor in the things of God. You're you're afraid to fail. What if we fail? At least we tried. I think I want that on my... When my life is over, if there is, I just want a little headstone. I don't want this big monument thing, this little thing. And I want on there, on the bottom of it, say, at least he tried. At least he tried. To me, I believe that anything under the age of 70 is premature death. People say, well, the word says he numbers our days. Yeah, he numbers our days, 70 years plus. 70 minimum. Anything under that is premature death is a casualty of war. You can argue with me all you want. I don't care. I'm not going to argue with you. That's what I believe. That's how I believe our God is a God of life, not a God of death. Whether we live or die, we still live. That's good news. But it says 70 plus years. And so I want that. I want us to be a part of what God is doing upon the earth.